The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Howdy and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino, and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today, we have a very special show planned for you. We have Sierra Goodry as our guest, and she is a custom and traditional taxidermist, owner of Dead Perfect Taxidermy. And we have a great conversation about taxidermy and the process that she uses. Um, and she was actually recently in a world competition. This was her first time competing, and she won two second places. So she's definitely highly skilled. So if this piques your interest, make sure to stay tuned. All right, now for our announcements, we, we have the UART, the University Art Galleries, has an exhibition currently open called Balancing Act, Floral Equilibria. And this is located in the J. Wayne Stark Gallery, MSC 1110. And this exhibition consists of uh, a project hosted by the Ben School of Floral Design, in which students were asked to design a floral design using hula hoops with a Cirque du Soleil theme. And they use all different types of mediums, so this must be a great show to visit. So make sure you take advantage of it. Open now until May 28th at the J. Wayne Stark Gallery, MSC 1110. All right, now for the second announcement, we have the Academy of Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, we'll be having the Artichoke Dance Company uh, here at the Aggie Park, uh, and this will be a free event. And this dance company actually focuses on themes of environmental justice, and for this performance, they will be focusing on water. Uh, so it will be titled, What Are We Waiting For? Um, and this actually will be an interactive performance that takes uh, the audience around campus, so just be prepared for that. Uh, and this will be from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at Aggie Park. Alrighty, now let's start my conversation with Sierra Goodry. Today in the studio, we have a very special guest. She is a traditional and custom taxidermist, owner of Dead Perfect Taxidermy. And if you'd like to uh, see her work while we're having this discussion, you can go to her Instagram and Facebook at Dead Perfect Taxidermy. So, hi, Sierra. How are you today? Great. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited for a conversation today. Um, you know, I feel like there's such a big taboo on, like, death itself. So I just wanted to, like, ask you, what do people, how do people react when you tell them you're a taxidermist? You know, I get a lot of weird questions about that. Some people are like, do you, oh, do you do pets or do you do other animals? Do you do rogue taxidermy? There's, it's, taxidermy is quite a large field and there are a lot of disciplines within it. Yeah. Um, but mainly I get the question of, oh, what's the coolest animal that you've mounted or, or something like that. So. Okay. So people are impressed when you tell them you're a taxidermist. Absolutely. They, oh, they cool. think it's really cool. And then, you know, a lot of people don't understand what goes into the art of taxidermy, mm -hmm. um, which is another thing that I like to talk about. So. All right. We'll definitely go into that. Yeah. Um, but I do like going through the background of my guests first. So I wanted to ask, where are you from? And was that environment essential in you deciding to go into taxidermy? So I grew up in a pretty small town. Uh, it was Gatesville, Texas. Um, I was always one of those kids that had probably something dead or alive stuffed in their pockets when they come in. You know, my mom loved that. <laughs> um, I, my my background is kind of in the veterinarian field. I worked in a vet hospital through through high school um, when I was at A and M. Um, I did graduate Texas A and M in two thousand and ten. Awesome. Um, so I always worked in one of the, I, my degree is actually in entomology. Oh wow! Um, so I'm a huge bug dork too, oh. which kind of led into the taxidermy thing, and, and then I'll touch on that here in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was always in the vet field, always around animals. 
I did grow up hunting, not as much as I would have liked to, of course, <laughs> right. um, but definitely enough, you know, to fill the freezers every year and feed the family. Right. Um, but then for the entomology part, um, again, huge bug dork. I actually started my career in taxidermy using dermestid beetles. Oh. Um, and so what that is, is they're pretty much flesh eating beetles. Um, so I use those to clean skulls, do skeletal articulations, and start with that. So that was kind of my basic foundation for my tax for the start of my taxidermy career. Okay, so your entomology, your experience in entomology led you into taxidermy? Yeah, or? for the most part. Okay. So starting off with the beetles and cleaning the skeletons kind of got me the foundation for how taxidermy starts because a lot of people don't know that anatomy is a really important part of taxidermy and mounting these animals to make them look lifelike. Mm -hmm. um, so having that understanding of how the skeletal system works starting off has actually been a huge benefit to me. Right. And was it was it a little frightening when you started or were you just desensitized from the beginning and with oh, your experience with vets? I was desensitized. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, between being in a vet hospital for most of my life or in the lab and then going to this, yeah, no, if it's dead, I usually want to poke it with a stick. So Right. Let's explore everything. Exactly, <laughs> yes. And what was the first animal you taxidermied ever? Uh, first animal actually I ever taxidermied was actually a mouse. Oh, really? And that was a great starting point. Mm -hmm. It looked completely awful. Oh, no. Um, and it looked like it got ran over. But that was a great starting point and for this. The next biggest animal, of course, I moved up to deer, which is oh, wow. mainly what I'm focusing on now. But starting off with the little animal and actually, again, it's the foundation that's important in all of this. You have to understand the anatomy, the way the eyes look, the way the nose works, the way the ears works. You have to think about all of those points. So a littler animal starting off is, is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I would that's what I would suggest if anybody was to want to get into this field, starting off with a smaller animal and really just learning and understanding and studying that animal. I bet a lot of people's first creations are a little off sometimes. Oh, yes. And I still have my first deer I mounted. I still have my first bobcat I mounted. And it's a good it's a good thing to look at. I mean, now they're not in the shop where people can see them. Right, yeah. Because they're a little scary. In the personal collection. Yeah, it's in the personal collection oh. in the closet in the house. No. <laughs> but to be able to look at those and see just how far I've come in the short amount of time that I've been doing this is, is very beneficial and makes you feel good about yourself yeah it must be very confirming um when did you know you wanted to start a business off of this so i started doing taxidermy part-time when i was still working at a &M. oh. um and then i kind of just got busier than i thought i was going to be <laughs> and had more people in, interested and involved in it and then i kind of caught myself where i was spending more time looking at taxidermy than my job. And so I was like, uh, okay. I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe my passion is not lab work anymore. And, and so maybe I need to step back. So hmm. it's probably been about a year and a half that I quit AM and and am doing this full time now. Oh, wow. It hasn't been that long. No, it hasn't been that long. And I, I've only been in this field. So I, four or five years, maybe. Wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm still kind of a newbie at this. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it does not look like it because I have Thank seen you. your work and it looks awesome. I've put a lot of time and effort and have taken many classes with other exceptional taxidermists, um, mm -hmm. as well as we have yearly conventions that have seminars. Um, wow. We actually have a Texas Taxidermy State Association. Oh, really? Um, so there is a professional development group that we have that we get together once a year for a huge convention. Um, and we also have a competition yearly. Oh, wow. And where does that take place? Um, so this year it's in Colleen. Okay. Um, we try to switch it around every year to different cities within Texas. Mm -hmm. Colleen's been kind of the, the hub for the past couple of years just because it's centrally located to most people. Right. It's closer for people to exactly. get to. Exactly. It's in the middle of Texas. <laughs> right. Um, and where do you source the animals that you use for taxidermy? So m most of what I'm doing now are coming from hunters. Okay. Um so that's the thing, uh, you know, there is actually, you can buy a lot of these creatures from trappers. Okay. Um, so sometimes I will do that if I need a certain specimen or if I need something that's just 
perfect, no damage. A lot of the times a, a trapper will have that. Um, but for the most part, it is from hunters or from me hunting. Um, I'm one of those that I only like to kind of meat hunt. So I'm, I'm kind of limited on what I take. Mm -hmm, um, right. But yeah, most of them is from customers. Um, there are a few of my private pieces in there. But you can actually buy a lot of this stuff online. Right. Um, there are multiple tanneries around the states that will have critters for sale that you could purchase. All right. And what what do you do with like like the wounds or the holes? Do you cover those up? or? Oh, no. So when you're a taxidermist, you wear a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. So I'm a master seamstress. Oh, really? Oh, man. My sewing skills are on point for this stuff. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so there is a, a lot more sewing involved than people imagine. Um, mm -hmm. Every little hole before you put it on the form has to be sewn up. Okay. Um, and do you use a machine for that or hand stitched? Hand stitched. No way. Hand stitched. <laughs> oh, wow. And I mean, and I've had holes that have been, you know, a foot long on a bobcat, and that's like half the cat. So, yeah. So, lots bit. of sewing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Learning something new. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> um, and what's the difference between the traditional and t custom taxidermy? Do you ever like create your own animals or how ex experimental are you? Um, yeah. So actually, uh, I'm in the process right now of creating a custom piece otter that I have. And it's actually one of my competition pieces. Oh, wow. um, so for this guy, I pushed myself and I actually carcass casted. The whole entire body so so what that is pretty much is you you skin the animal take the hide off and everything and i'm tanning that mm -hmm. so with that body you have just the carcass of it mm -hmm. what you do then is you would freeze it in place so if i have my pose picked i'm going to freeze that animal in place i will cut the legs off and probably the body in half while frozen mm -hmm. and then i will cast that so from casting oh. that, you can use Plaster of Paris. I've cast it in Bondo. Um, there's a company called Smooth On that has a bunch of really good products for casting. Um, so I have created a custom pose, custom form for that animal. Right, and straight from the animal. Straight yeah. from the animal. So, wow. so everything should be anatomically correct. Right. I have my muscle groups in the right place. Mm -hmm. I have all my correct connection points with everything. Right. Um, so you just get a lot more realistic pose that way than to say if you were to go to one of our supply companies and buy a form for that. Right. Yeah, much more precise in yes. that aspect. All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. Support for KAMU comes from the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. Um, can you explain like the artistic process throughout the whole thing? And I know it might differ from different animals. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, starting off every time an animal comes into my shop, you know, usually the hunter brings it in, skin still on, frozen whole is how I like them. Hmm. Um, I will take a bunch of pictures. So especially if, if we're talking about bobcats, I really enjoy mounting bobcats. And it's kind of one of the things that I, I'm specializing in. They have a lot of hair patterns that you see <laughs> that normally when people are looking at them, they don't think about that. And those hair patterns have to go in specific areas of that animal, as well as the connection, your ear connection points. You know, there's there's a something called a caruncle, which is on the inside of the eye. You have to be aware of that. Yeah. So it's not just just your outside looking anatomy i mean there's also interior anatomy that you have to think about and different connection points within that cat right that's not so obvious it's not so obvious mm -hmm. exactly that a normal person wouldn't think to look for or look at right um so a bunch of pictures help um, i like to take pictures uh again bobcats have a lot of very pronounced hair patterns on their face so looking where those go and taking a picture of that beforehand is a good idea um, from there i will skin the body out 
Um, there's a couple of different ways you can, and they say there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. There really is a thousand ways to skin a cat. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so what's your way? <laughs> um, my way, most of the time I do what we call a dorsal cut, which is just cutting it down the back and pulling the legs out that way then. Okay. Um, it, so it, either I go a dorsal or a case skin and a case skin is where you just cut around the back of the legs and kind of roll the body, the skin up like a sock and take it off. Okay. Um, I know this. Uh-huh. Uh, this is not the best of talking, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very. It's, it's a little gross, but um, so after skinning the animal, you actually have to, you know, flesh everything. We have to get all the flesh off of there. You don't want any kind of red meat or anything. We have what you have to. Do. You have to turn the ears. So literally on every animal that we taxidermy, you have to turn the ears. So you literally split the ears in half and invert them inside out. So what you're doing is you're separating the back skin from the ear cartilage Mm. and then inverting them that way. Okay. And then we have to split the lips and the nose. So, you know, they have a lot more meat around those whisker pads. So Mm. you have to be able to be sure to get in there with a scalpel, trim all that off. It's pretty much what you're doing. Any kind of red meat or blood left behind can start a bacterial growth. And then we get what we call slippage. So slippage is when you're start, starting to lose hair or epidermis layers, and that is set in from rot for the most part. And mm. that's what you don't want. You don't want to yeah. do that. So salt is your best friend in taxidermy. Okay. Right. Everything gets salted. Um, it works really well at pulling out some of the fat solubles in there, um, really getting all of the interstitial tissue secretions out of it and is that through like salt water or nope just straight salt straight up salt straight okay. salt <laughs> i right. have a whole salting room in the shop oh. and it kind of looks like you, you could do like a snow angel in there and the salt that i have uh-huh. <laughs> it's literally a salting it's a room full of salt that'd be fun, that'd be fun to go do <laughs> you walk in there and you're like kind of push stuff around and then you lick your lips and you're like oh that's salty (laughs) not licking the lips yeah Yeah. (laughs) yummy (laughs) yep tasty um but from after that from skinning and salting then we move into the tanning procedure um Mm -hmm. i do like to do my own tanning um you know some of the bigger high production shops send out their tanning we have tanneries all over the state as well as all over the united states Mm -hmm. Um, so there are multiple options for that. Um, I personally like to do my own tanning. I taught myself to tan before I taught myself to mount because I wanted to be able to understand every single process that went into the whole process. Right. Um, so, you know, there are some taxidermists I know that don't know how to tan. Hmm, and okay. and I think that's I think I helped myself by learning to tan and doing all of that first. Right. Um, Because that, I mean, again, it just gives you the better understanding of the process itself. Um, And what does tanning mean? um, So tanning is pretty much, it's a chemical process. Um, Pretty much what it does is it breaks down all of the organics in the skin. Okay. Pulls them out and then it kind of sets the hair in place also. So then, so I'm doing hair on tanning. You know, there are a lot of tans where the hair comes off too. My process is hair on because you still want that hair for the mount. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so that's all really all it is. It, I use what we call a safety acid. It has a pH of about one. So it's pretty acidic, but you can still stick your hand in it. Okay. (laughs) And so that's why we call it safety acid. Hmm. Um, It will make you a little itchy. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, advise going and sticking your hand in it but if you accidentally get it on there it's better than some of the old school guys are using like formic acid which that would hurt if you stuck your hand in there (laughs) so i i choose the safety acid method myself um yeah and you still use gloves i'm oh yeah i still use gloves for everything (laughs) you know there are you have cuts you know Mm. if you look at my hands most days there are cuts all over my hands or stabs i mean I work with some pretty sharp tools most of the time. Yeah. So if you were not to wear gloves and stick your hand in there, you'd feel it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but after the tanning process, mm-hmm. um, then then you can do move to the mounting stage. So it usually takes me about a week and a half to tan an animal. Um, that's not hands-on all the time. Usually they're just soaking in the liquids that I have mm-hmm. um, in between flushing and thinning um, the animal itself. But so after the tanning, take it out, we put an oil on it, 
which kind of gives you it when you oil it it allows you to have that stretch again that you want instead of just a stiff piece of leather mm -hmm. um so from that there are there actually which a lot of people don't know this one of the biggest taxidermy supply companies actually has a headquarter in Caldwell. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. I think so a lot of people would benefit from knowing There is that. a huge taxidermy supply company in Caldwell. It's called McKinsey's. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the main taxidermy supply company that we have in the United States. And it just so happens that one of the headquarters is in Caldwell, Texas. Right, <laughs> right in our neck of the woods. <laughs> Why Caldwell? I have no idea. I still have not figured it out to this day. But I'm not going to complain because it's very beneficial for someone like me to just be able to drive and pick up a form. Right, yeah. So a lot of the, the forms that we use are a two-part polyurethane foam. Um, so when you see an animal on the wall or something like that, and you always wonder what's underneath them, it's foam. Okay. Yeah. It's just, I always did wonder that. It's a high density polyurethane foam. Okay. And that gives us the ability to carve out the muscle groups, um, as well as hold that skin in place too, because you couldn't do it on anything soft. Um, and how do you glue the skin to that foam? Um, so hide paste. Hide paste. Okay. Yeah. That, that's what we call it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it, some of the old school guys will still use wallpaper paste. Oh, wow. Which will work also. Um, but there are certain companies that have developed this hide paste. Um, and it's it's just a super stiff glue for the most part. Okay. Um, the eyes that we use are glass for oh. the most part. Um, you can use acrylic also. The glass just look really better. And that that's kind of what brings them back to life is that, that glass eye. Yeah. And how do you choose what position to have the animals in? Um, a lot of the times I'll let the customers choose. Um, if they tell me I have free range, you know, I'll try to pick something really cool or out there that, that people don't get to see a lot. Um, but for the most part, I let the customers choose. You know, it's always good. I always tell them, you know, think where you want it in your house. What direction do you want it looking at? How big of a space you might need? There's a lot to consider when putting in an animal in the house. You know, you don't want a bobcat that you put on the wall to just be staring at another corner of the wall yeah. or staring at the ceiling or not looking where you're going to be looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the customer's job is to look in their house and tell me, okay, I want it here. What pose can we do with it right here? Right. I mean, the ones from my, that I've seen from your social media look so live, like like it's like a still in nature. You even like decorate it around it to make it look like more natural. Um, so I think that's awesome. That, that, yeah, that. and you know, there's a lot of people to just you know stick them on the wall or stick them on a log. I try to do a little bit of habitat around them yeah. just to make it look like it's back in nature. You know, what we're using is fake mm -hmm. for the most part. So. You know, trying to go with that extra little bit and making it look more realistic or more like it's out in nature is, is something that I try to do. It's really a beautiful effect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what's been your proudest creation to this point? Well, my proudest creation will be this otter when I'm done with it, oh, right. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a couple of nice bobcats that I've done that, and, you know, going back to talking about the competition stuff you know i i have been to a few competitions mm -hmm. we actually had the world competition this past year oh, wow. and How'd it, that go? it went great i actually got two second places um awesome. so in world for my first time i will take that congratulations yeah <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> um but yeah so that so they do worlds every other year okay. in the united states mm -hmm. so one year it's in the united states and the next year it's in europe um okay. Which there are some really great European taxidermists also. I bet. <laughs> but but we're actually getting getting up to competition season now. Um, the second weekend in May is actually Louisiana. Uh, so I will travel to other states for these competitions also. Every state has a taxidermy association. Mm -hmm. um, and so every year, every state will have a convention. So this year, I will probably go to Louisiana, Oklahoma, Texas, of course, and then potentially Arkansas. All right. So you're traveling all over yeah. the country. <laughs> awesome. I like it. And, you know, Facebook is great nowadays because you get to meet all these other taxidermists and everything. But it's nice to go to these shows and finally put a face with the person that you've been talking to online for 
a year or something like that. Right. Um, Because we all like to pick each other's brains on, if if you see a taxidermist post something, you're like, oh, I really like the way they did that. You know, I I'll try to be that person. If someone was to reach out to me and ask me that, I would, of course, willingly share that information with them because mm-hmm. it's only going to make you better when you ask questions. Right. That's awesome. You're still giving to other people, not gatekeeping yeah, this no, information. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> what would you say to someone who is starting off taxidermy? What are some, like, advices that you would give them? My advice is to, and, and this is something that I didn't learn till later on, is mm-hmm. that anatomy and reference study. That mm-hmm. is going to be your best friend when you're going to mount that animal. Look at those live pictures. Watch videos. When you're skinning an animal, you know, pay attention to what you're skinning out and how you're skinning it out, what those feet bones look like, how much meat is in this area, because you're going to have to put that back right. when you go to the form. Mm-hmm. And the forms, the forms are great, but they're not perfect. You still have to sculpt and build and make different parts that aren't there on that form. Mm, right. Uh, I saw that you were also part of the American Daughters of Conservation. Yes. Um, why do you think is it is it's important to encourage women in this field? You know, this has been a a very heavily male driven field for a long time, mm-hmm. um, but it has been nice the last couple of years. There are a lot of great females coming up. Um, I know some fantastic female artists, um, and it's just great to actually see that the females are actually getting the recognition in this field. Finally, right. Mm-hmm. Um, but the American Daughters of Conservation, um, that's kind of like a women's hunting group. Hmm. So what we do is we educate conservation through hunting because um, you actually can't have conservation without hunting. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, so hunting plays a very, very important role in conservation of these animals, hmm. um, whether it's, you know, you look at California right now. They put a ban on a lot of the hunting of predators. So your bobcats, your coyotes, your mountain lions. And now they're having coyotes attack toddlers in the middle of the daylight. Uh-oh. Um, because there's no control on these populations. So mm-hmm. they're just going to eventually start moving into human and human areas. And, right. and that causes issues. I mean... Coyotes will kill your little cat or your little dog in a heartbeat. So looking at that conservation part of it, you know, and it Mm -hmm. goes back to even, you know, we can start looking at some of the elk populations that they have in California also. They're not hunting those populations, and now they are actually interfering with some of the farming down there. Mm, Right. Um, I've heard about, like, boars here. Oh, gosh, yes. Hogs. We have a horrible hog problem. Um, that's just fun shooting right there. Yeah. Because, <laughs> man, you you want to get rid of as many of those as you can. Oh, uh, yeah. Because all they do is tear up land. Yeah, but that's interesting to see that um, you're promoting conservation, but also w- through hunting. So yeah. It's, it's kind of like contradicting in a way, but it's not. <laughs> it is, but it's not. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I would highly encourage anybody. You know, we have a couple of great. I think we have a Texas Trophy Hunters Association here at A&M. That's a great place to get into. They do a lot of conservation. Awesome. Um, there's a the International Safari Club, which I know Houston has a chapter. Um, they do a lot of great conservation. Um, I, I wish we could help people understand that conserv- like hunting is conservation. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're doing our part here. Yes, <laughs> Informing yes, we the, are. the people, of course. Um, do you have anything you want to say to our audience about whether it be taxidermy itself or your business, Dead Perfect Taxidermy? Um, yeah, if, you know, I'm usually in the shop most of the time. If anybody has any interest of coming and checking out and seeing what is actually involved, my shop doors are open all the time. You're more than welcome to come over and take a look. Um, you know, just hit me up on Facebook or Instagram or something like that. And yeah, I, I would love to have people come over and share the knowledge that I have and if anybody's interested in it or just wants to see what I do all day. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's very interesting. So yeah, make sure to go to Instagram or Facebook at Dead Perfect Taxidermy if you want to reach out and work with Sierra maybe. Um, well, Sierra, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. I'm Hector Nino and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. 
You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu.